Paris. Day two, day one was mostly sleeping. Good morning. <laughs> After a 10 hour flight, we're off to see the Essentials tour. We're going to the Eiffel Tower. We're gonna check it all out today. Well, all of the big stuff. And how be you looking cute? And I got a beret. <laughs> Let's go, guys. Yay! We're checking out the Opera House, one of our first stops. The rest of the stops are happening as we're driving on the bus. Um, but anytime we'll stop, I will be sure to pull this camera out so you guys can see what we're checking out. <laughs> so pretty. I'm in love with Paris and it's my day two. have the beautiful Arc de Triomphe, which so many of us are familiar with. It actually goes to commemorate those who fought in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Moving on to the Notre Dame Cathedral, it sits along the beautiful Seine River, and it's best known for its French Gothic architecture. I think it's considered the most beautiful French Gothic architecture in the world. Um, it's beautiful from all sides, including the inside. There's also, you'll see here, a huge line of people to get in. It is free, there's no tickets required, but you need to show up really early in the morning if you don't want to wait forever to get inside. Here it is behind us, guys. We finally made it to admire the Eiffel Tower. We're gonna do a tour later today, but there she is. What do you think? It's life goal. <laughs> life goal accomplished. It's life goal. Life goal. Uh, I already tried to fix my makeup, so. <laughs> so this is the view of the Eiffel Tower from the Trocadero, which is quite a ways away, but I mean, it's still so big and stunning from where we're standing. We're gonna do a tour later to see it internally and from the second level, so you can get a city view of it. But I love this view. I love seeing everyone get excited over it. I know I was feeling super excited. This is also the spot where we're gonna be doing our photos later in the week. I feel like everyone who knows me knows how big of a life goal this is. And it's crazy. Up close and personal. How you doing, boo? I'm excited particularly for my life. <laughs> okay, we are heading up inside the Eiffel Tower. This is the view going from the first to the second platform. It's really high. You can actually go all the way to the top to the very summit. Um, we didn't do that, but here we're riding up an elevator that's actually going at a slant instead of actually shooting straight up. It kind of runs along this rail that has you at an axis, kind of a tilt, which is exciting. And we keep going and going. We came at the perfect time. We didn't have to wait very long and I can't wait to see the view. <laughs> and we made it. So we're looking out now to the Trocadero where we were earlier, a place where we're gonna be shooting our photos. So just a different view looking back now. Good morning. We're standing outside the Louvre, about to go in. The line isn't too bad. We actually unintentionally took some advice that we saw online to enter through the mall kind of via the subway and it totally paid off. The line is a lot smaller than we expected and we're right by the pyramid, the bottom half of it. Time to go see our girl Mona Lisa. So here she is in all her glory. She's behind very thick bulletproof glass and there's definitely a crowd. There is always a crowd to see her, but we got to see her up close and I loved every second. How do I think of the Mona Lisa? It's right behind you. Uh, Mona Lisa is really beautiful, probably better than I thought it was going to be. People said that it was super small, but I actually think that it's really pretty. <laughs> So I definitely expected it to be a lot smaller. Um, most people said eight and a half by 11, but it's actually a pretty good size painting. It's beautiful, I love it. I wish I wish I could have it in my house and there's no way that's possible, but it's a lot more beautiful than I even expected. So I'm excited to explore the rest of the Louvre. So this is the Greek sculpture known as the Winged Victory and it was actually created in the second century BC. 
so a very, very long time ago. <laughs> We're checking out Napoleon's Grand Salon. It's stunning, of course. Let's see. It's beautiful. Gorgeous. So I just wanted to soak it in one last time. This beautiful room, these chandeliers, these walls, these paintings. It's all so stunning. I love it. We just finished looking at the crown jewels. What do you think? I think the jewels are beautiful, but the room is just magnificent. This whole room is really beautiful. The crowns, the diamonds, the sapphires, the emeralds. I'm just gonna give you guys another look at this room because- The walls. The, the walls, the ceiling. I'm gonna give you guys another look at this room. It's just, it's so stunning in person. I hope it comes, I hope it comes across in video because we don't wanna leave this section. It's gold everywhere and statues and paintings and like, no section has been forgotten. So let's take another look. So this is why we don't want to leave this room. I mean, look at the ceiling. No inch of it is not just like incredibly impressive. The walls have paintings. Everything in here is so perfect and beautiful. It really feels like a palace. I know it used to be, but in this room, it feels like an actual palace. And of course, I had to get a close-up of these crowns and tiaras and they did belong to royals at one time and some were even wedding gifts next here's a look from a balcony um, right outside the Louvre cafe it's just such a great place for photos and to really take it all in you see the glass pyramid you can see the whole side of the Louvre the inner side it's just massive and beautiful next up we're heading into the Pantheon they have this awful photo on the front, I don't know why, but we do want to take a look inside and then we have a chance to compare it to Rome later on our trip. So the Pantheon has been a lot of things in its life. It now holds the remains of distinguished French citizens. Um, it has a lot of cool structures and pillars inside. So from here, I'm gonna move us on to our cooking class. We're gonna jump right in with our teacher and see what he has to say about monkfish. That's true. Um, so like I said, whenever you're picking a monkfish, um, there's no head. So the way we look at it is if you look at the skin and how the fat is uh, splitting or not, they're all glistening, they're in one piece, so those guys are good to go today. Maybe all year round that they have tomatoes here, that does not mean that those are the tomatoes that they actually grew up watching the sun. So whenever you have vegetables with a really thin skin, as like peppers and eggplants, zucchinis, um, tomatoes, all of those guys with really thin skins out on the ground, they need a lot, a lot, a lot of direct sun. So the season is really in the middle, smack middle of the summer, towards the end of October, um, beginning of October. <laughs> now we can just put it down here. We keep it in really low heat. And... Can come take a look. We're gonna add just touch oil like this. And we're gonna put that facing down like that. Gonna help me. 
So we're gonna all the endives facing down and as low as your um, cooking heat goes. Really low heat. It means hazelnut butter. Because, it's not because we add hazelnuts in it, it's because they have a smell and the color of the hazelnut. So, right now, whenever you have it, so I just added butter and herbs, that's it. And you see, all of a sudden, they will have this kind of a foam on top. And then the foams are gonna, you see that they're brown specks and they're turning brown. That means it's almost ready. So, whenever you do that, the reason I give them a good whisk is that basically all these white bits from the butter are gonna settle at the bottom of the pot and then if you don't whisk them, it's just that one single layer that's gonna get colored every single time and that's gonna get just burnt and nothing else is cooked on the top. So you give it a good whisk. And now it's time for me to put my watermelon burrata tomato salad together. Um, so I am just grabbing a couple slices of watermelon I'm going to go ahead and add a couple tomatoes. I'm opting for the little guys, not the big slices. And then normally you would also put in slices of mozzarella, which you'll see will do. They ran out of mozzarella when I got to my turn. Uh, don't worry, will share with me, but that's why you're not seeing it here. So I'm adding my little grape and cherry tomatoes. I don't want to add any big slices. And then I'm adding a little brown butter. Yes, I'm putting butter on watermelon and tomato. Just a little bit. I think it adds just enough flavor. And then we're gonna sprinkle some salt, and then I'm gonna get some balsamic vinegar, and it's gonna be ready to go. I am gonna steal that little bit of mozzarella from Will. Oh, and this is fresh mint that we just chopped up. I'm only adding a little bit. I'm not a big fan of mint in my food. And here I am trying not to spill, and of course, I, I get a hefty serving of balsamic vinegar, but it's okay, I love it. And I'm ready to go. Now it's time for Will to make his salad. This is me making my salad. Look at me go. I got watermelon. I also got a lot of mozzarella, which Nikki didn't get, but then she stole half my mozzarella. <laughs> so that's what happened. I was super skeptical of tomatoes with watermelon. That seems like a very weird mix, but I will say that I liked it quite a bit, quite a bit more than I thought. You see this uh, girl to the left of me, not the older one, the younger one. She was creeping up in our space and trying to have a conversation with us. It was pretty awkward, but we tried to entertain her anyway. Um, yeah, that girl. She's a little weird. I'm doing my salt bay, getting some salt on my watermelon, tomato, and mozzarella. Dropping in some mint. This girl's still creeping on me. A little weird. She also took one of the mozzarellas that I think Nikki should have taken, but that's not my business though. Uh, putting on some brown butter here, make it the perfect plate right before I disassembled it again so that I could give Nikki the mozzarella. Um, I thought one slice of mozzarella still worked out pretty good, so I don't know what two was, and I, uh, I messed up when I was pouring that balsamic vinegar, but that's okay. It tasted good nonetheless. Yay! <laughs> We filled our bellies at our cooking class and now we're checking out the cafe from Amelie, of course. <laughs> uh, we're not gonna go inside. We heard in general it's a little um, rude and not the best and people go there because, I mean, Amelie was filmed there, but we had to stop by and see it. <laughs> Onward, now we're going to... Sacre Coeur. Let's go. <laughs> Got to walk all these stairs, boo. Yeah, again. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, we got a broken phone. Biggest tip from Paris so far. Bring the right shoes, and then bring the right shoes, and then bring the right shoes, right? And do the Stairmaster before you go. <laughs> like a million times. We've done so many stairs. We are already out of shape, so it feels twice as hard. <laughs> it's like what happens when you take the stairs. It's pretty exhausting. I don't know how hard it would be for someone in shape, to be honest. It's hard for us. I would say we're not like the most fit people, but we're also the not the most out of shape people. Bring comfy shoes. Save the cute shoes for photos. Oh my god, let's hope we make it back to the hotel. So I took an interesting subway ride and 
Um, it got us to Luxembourg Garden, which is behind me. It's really crowded and also the metro goes really fast. I had no idea it went that fast, um, but it took almost no time to get here. So we're gonna take a walk around and I'll show you guys what it looks like. Actually, I might have a full battery. Okay, let's go. Some initial thoughts for the Luxembourg Garden. This place is so crowded, and I know everyone says like, go first thing in the morning, but you can't go to everything first thing in the morning. <laughs> like, that would be impossible. So we tried the afternoon, but look at, let's see if you can see. Back here, there's just so many people. There's like no space to even sit. Um, it's pretty, it's really pretty, but it's packed. So if you can come in the morning, do it. But I know everyone says that for every monument and every everything. You might just gotta deal with the crowd in this one, guys. So here's kind of some of what I'm talking about with the herds and major crowds of people here at Luxembourg Garden. I'm not sure what it's like early in the morning or later in the evening. Maybe some of these people go home. Um, but it is a beautiful place. There's fountains and ducks and it's a cool place to hang out. I would recommend maybe bringing like lunch or something to do because there's not necessarily an activity here for you. Um, and now it's a new day, so on to a new adventure. Good morning. Today we are at the Palace of Versailles. We're about to go inside. We're just exploring the gardens a little bit before our timed entry and I'm super excited to go in. I feel like we can do a whole geek out video about this because there's so many interesting facts. Let's go. Are you excited to go inside? What do you think it's gonna look like? Um, I think it's gonna look pretty majestic. Is that the right <laughs> word? Yes. People use it a lot for dogs. Oh. <laughs> but it's also <laughs> majestic and royal. Royal, that's the word I was looking for. Majestic. Majestic is royal. a good word, but it makes me think of like people always say about like huskies or dogs running. I don't know. <laughs> so we've made it into the palace. We're looking at the ornate walls and ceilings and paintings. Um, a lot of the photos on the wall are actually relatives of Louis the Fourteenth. So he has his grandsons or his nephews up on the wall. Um, there's so many things to see here and there's also so many details that I would never be able to remember. But our guide was great. She did talk us through most of it. Um, we were just getting to see all the different rooms. I don't believe the entire palace is open to the public. If it is, it might be separate tours, but we all went to the same general area. So I'm not sure what the rest of the palace is like. I do know that a lot of the rooms are actually empty because there are so many rooms. Um, but we got to see all the rooms that were filled. The furniture is not original just because of everything that happened in history. It was actually destroyed when people, when like the French people rebelled and um, everything that happened basically after Marie Antoinette really led to the destruction of all of this. And here we are entering the Hall of Mirrors. And what's so genius is that they thought to use mirrors back then with these windows so that they would have this amazing light source. Because back then it was really just about candles for light um, or fire essentially and candles were really expensive especially ones that didn't smoke black smoke and ruin the ceiling so this is just a beautiful room and for anyone that cares it's where Kim Kardashian had her rehearsal dinner for her wedding I don't care but random fun fact <laughs> welcome to the garden scene. hello So we are now walking the grounds. We did the palace. It's, I have so many thoughts. I'm gonna wait till I get back home. I'd like to see all the things I'm thinking right now. I have to digest it. But we're walking the grounds. Mm. It's pretty cool. It kind of feels like a secret garden. I mean, obviously it's not secret, but it's really cool. There's statues, stuff. <laughs> And it kind of just feels endless a little bit. What do you say? It does. <laughs> oh man. Can you hear the classical music? Possibly?
I can't imagine walking the ground in like a beautiful royal gown and just being like the shit in 19, in what is it, 1850 or like 1500. That would be amazing. We got a fountain, let's go check out this fountain. Okay, we're gonna do a lightning round of random facts I learned on this tour. One, most people really live until like 30 or 35 back in the time of Louis XIV and 15th and 13th. So if you're 30 or 35, you're done. Fact number two, marrying your cousin was cool. <laughs> it was like a thing that they thought was gonna make your baby prettier and better and smarter. Very Cersei, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. Um, also, there was actually ceremonies to see the king wake up. Like, literally there's a fence in front of his bed and people would come and wait and they would open the curtain and he would wake up and it was like a thing. I, I don't, I don't even know what to do with that. What about you babe, do you have a fact to share? Everything that you've learned. They would get married at the age of 13 because their lives yes! were Yes! What do you think of that? I think that's a little crazy. I can't imagine being a 13 year old king. I think the weirdest part is that it almost makes sense because they only live to 30. Like, if they did it any later, would it even matter? They have to like pump out babies, bam, bam, bam. So, I don't know, it's weird. There's so many random facts. I feel like as they keep popping up, I'm gonna keep sharing them. Okay, thought of a few more facts. The castle, or the Palace of Versailles, took 48 years to complete. It also had 26,000 people working on it to make it go as fast as possible, and it still took 48 years. Um, it was kind of a flop. No one really liked it <laughs> that much. It was cold, too big, not a hit. Major flop, it was like Mariah Carey glitter flop. Like, bad. Um, what else? There's so many things I feel like that were just thrown at me and they're just like popping up into my brain. Um, when they painted people, it was their version of Photoshop, well for royals and like upper class, it was their version of Photoshop to get painted but with all your imperfections kind of removed. So like big noses to small noses, thin, like whatever the ideal was, that's how they made you look in portraits when you're royal and nobility. So Photoshop is not new guys. Facetune has always been a thing. <laughs> Can you even see me? It feels like a gladiator moment. Isn't it? So grand. I just feel like I could really get used to this. And that's the problem. <laughs> hey, there we are. Wait, can you get some runs? Oh, oh, you're running, you're running. <laughs> There's more runs on this end. We're, oh, we're rotating to see more ruins. Ruins everywhere. You just spin in one big Roman ruin circle. <laughs> I can. So we're just walking through today. We passed through the Jewish ghetto, looking at some ruins. I have to be honest with you guys, the ruins in Rome need a lot of imagination for. So little is left. Uh, yeah. Definitely something unexpected, but I mean, cool to look at. You're just gonna need to imagine, imagine what it used to be, I think, a lot more than I expected. What do you think? I agree. <laughs> All right, Gladiator fans, we have made it to the Coliseum. Get excited. It looks pretty spectacular in this shot, I will admit. Um, it's not just my great videography skills. <laughs> this is just a really good angle for the Coliseum. But you might be a little disappointed by the inside because it's not as in great shape. Um, even this isn't really in great shape. As you can see, almost everything has been destroyed. The seats are gone. It's really torn down to the brick. Um, a lot of things were stolen from the Colosseum just because it wasn't a religious place back then. So once the whole time and the whole like community moved towards like religion, 
Um, they destroy things that weren't based around Christianity or whatever gods they were worshipping at that time. So down here is where the floor would have been. What you're seeing right now is what would have been underneath where they kept the animals, the trapdoors, and even some of the gladiators as they prepare to come on stage. And so right outside we have the Ark of Constantine. I mean, these people loved arches and arcs <laughs> back in the day. Um, so it commemorates Constantine's victory. I guess it's really the best way to, to show what you did even when you're gone. What did we just stumble across? We just were walking down the street in the Pantheon. So we are now in the Vatican Museum. We're checking out mummies, a bunch of different artifacts. I didn't realize there were so many historical artifacts in the Vatican Museum. I just thought it was all religious things relating to uh, Catholicism, but there's actually so much history here. There is also a stunning view of Rome uh, if you find the perfect window. Our guide really knew all the spots in the museum, so we got really lucky and got this gorgeous shot. Um, now we're in St. Peter's Basilica, which is the largest church, I believe, in the world. Um, it really is stunning in person. I feel like the video can't even capture just the magnitude of this building and just all the details. And it's just like a really great place, I think, to actually end this vlog. So excited about our trip to Europe. Can't wait for the next adventure. Thank you guys for watching.